In this video, I'd like to discuss the form of the material law for elastic materials. And to keep things simple, I'm going to restrict attention to the small deformation case, so where we can use the small strain tensor to describe the kinematics of the material. So let's first consider what it means to talk about an elastic material. So the most common situation is you have a bar of material, you apply a load F, it starts at a length L0 and then extends out to another length L. And so the typical thing that's done is one makes a plot of the stress versus the strain. And out of this experiment, the stress is the force divided by the cross-sectional area. And the strain is the change in length divided by the original length. And so that traces out a curve on the stress-strain diagram. And what we mean by elastic is that if we release the load, that we simply recover the motion that we saw on the loading cycle. So the, the unloading curve traces out exactly the loading curve. Now, from a mathematical point of view, what we're saying here is that stress is strictly a function of the present value of the strain. It doesn't matter how fast I apply the load. It doesn't matter in which order I apply the load, whether I strain first, release the strain, add it back in. It's not going to make any difference. The value of the stress always depends strictly on the current value of the strain. Now, in what we're going to set up here is we're going to assume that there's a free energy function, a Helmholtz free energy function for the material. And just as with the stress being simply a function of the present value of the strain, we're going to also assume for elastic materials that the free energy only depends on the present value of the strain. And the last thing that we're going to require for elastic materials is that the dissipation be zero. So there's no hysteresis, no loss of energy in the loading and unloading cycle. So all the work that you put in during loading, you recover during unloading. And so these three mathematical statements are what we mean by an elastic material. So we're going to require that. That's part of our definition of what an elastic material is. And now I'd like to look at the consequences that are associated with these mathematical statements. So first of all, the dissipation is minus the time rate of change of the free energy plus the stress power. So the stress double contracted with the strain rate. So the stress here, that's the stress, the Cauchy stress, the, the tensor that appears in Cauchy's theorem. And the strain rate is simply the time rate of change of the small strain tensor, which expressed in terms of the displacement is the symmetric displacement gradient. So grad u plus grad u transpose divided by 2. OK, so now the dissipation here, I want to be equal to 0. So let me go ahead and first compute what the time rate of change of the free energy is. And then we'll plug that in and set it equal to 0 and see what the consequence is. So the time rate of change of the free energy is going to be the derivative of the energy with respect to its argument, which is epsilon. In the, and we're doing this now in the tensorial case, so it depends on the full tensor, double contracted with the strain rate. And the reason that we get this form here, you can think of the free energy, if it's a function of the strain tensor, then it depends on every component of the strain. So I have to take the derivative of the free energy with, say, the first component times the time derivative of the first component plus the derivative of the free energy with the second component times the time derivative of the free energy with respect to the, or with the, let me say that again, let me write it down. So if I take the derivative of the free energy with respect to the first component, let's say epsilon 1, 1, then by chain rule, I have to multiply that by epsilon 1, 1 dot. And then it also depends on epsilon 1, 2. So I have to take its derivative with respect to epsilon 1, 2, and then multiply by epsilon 1, 2 dot, again by chain rule, and I keep going all the way out to epsilon 3, 3. So there are nine terms there, and that's why I've written it here with the double contraction notation. It makes it a lot more compact. So let's go ahead and plug this result here back in to the relationship up there. And I'm also going to set it equal to 0, so I'm setting d equal to 0. And I'll factor out the strain right here, and I end up with the stress minus the derivative of the free energy with respect to epsilon, double contract with epsilon dot, needs to be equal to zero always. 
And by always, I mean for all strain and strain rate. So if I'm saying it has to be true for all strain, that means I have no control over the value in the square brackets. And the only thing I have control over is the strain rate, but the strain rate is arbitrary also. So the only way for this relationship to work out is if sigma is actually equal to the derivative of the free energy with respect to the strain. So that's something known as the Coleman and Null argument, sometimes also known as the Coleman and Null procedure. That tells us that stress is equal to the derivative of the free energy with respect to the strain. So when we have this kind of structure here with a free energy and a derivative giving us a stress, we usually call these hyperelastic materials. If we want, uh, we can write this initially also. It says that the ij component of the stress is equal to the derivative of the free energy with respect to corresponding uh, ij component of the strain. So sigma 1, 2, for instance, is equal to the derivative of psi with respect to epsilon 1, 2. Sigma 3, 3 is the derivative of psi with respect to epsilon 3, 3, etc. So this is the, the basic setup uh, for hyperelastic materials. And the, the main sort of conceptual step here is this application of the Coleman and Null argument to produce this expression here that says that the stress is related to the free energy via the, its derivative 